Welcome to the Fabulous 413. I'm Khalees Smith. And I'm Monty Belmonte. Later in the show, a government document about aliens. Ooh. Mr. Universe, Hampshire College's Salman Hamid, breaks down the gist of a recently released military paper on the subject. And Lost History, finding the light again when we speak with local historian Erica Slocum about her project surrounding the Liberty Heights housing project of Holyoke. But first, we love a happy farm story around here. Yes, we do. And so when we hear about one, we're bound to head for the source. We're at Kitchen Garden Farm in Sunderland, where I've been a longtime fan of your sriracha and your salsas. I love your garden, Yara. It shows up in my farm share, and it's the best. And I also get to eat the whole jar by myself because my partner does not like pickles. We're going to see that We're, being made today. They're yes. making it right now. But we've gone through a farming year of what felt like tragedy after tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. And this is actually a positive farming story for here in Western Mass at Kitchen Garden. What's your name? Lily Israel. And what's your name? Max Traunstein. You have taken over this farm from the longtime farmers here, Caroline Pam and Tim Wilcox, who started this farm over a decade and a half ago. Tell us your relationship with the farm. Uh, so I've been working here for eight years. Um, I've been managing the harvest and wash and pack and sales side of the farm. And yeah, I just love this place and I'm really excited to be taking it over. What about you, Max? I have worked here for 10 years. I started working at this farm right out of college and I've been here ever since. And about five years ago, I took over the, the main production operations side of the business. And um, yeah, I'm just glad to be able to step into a, a bigger role here and take the whole thing over, you know? <laughs> yeah. We've talked about what we think you are famous for, the srirachas and the salsas and, and things like that. And all the dried peppers. But what else is growing here? <laughs> so we are a 70-acre diversified organic farm. At this point, about half or a little more than half of our revenue is our value-added products, our sriracha, salsa, jardinera, etc. But we grow a lot, a lot of fresh vegetables. We sell almost a million dollars of fresh vegetables vegetables every year to lots of local restaurants, grocery stores, awesome local distributors who bring our stuff farther away. And it's a really big mix of vegetables. It's peppers and tomatoes and carrots and cauliflower, cucumbers, summer squash, almost everything. And as far as the what you're calling value-added products go, I was psyched years ago when I was watching David Chang's Ugly Delicious and he opened the refrigerator and there was yeah. Kitchen Garden Sriracha in his <laughs> fridge. So how far afield are these value-added products from your fields here in Sunderland going? I, I'll be in a grocery store in random part of the country and there it is. Yeah, totally. We have our stuff in all 50 states uh-huh. and yeah, yeah. Yes. We can go on our website and see a map of all the places we are. We hit all 50 states a few years ago for the first time. Were those products a part of the beginning of the farm or did they come later? Were you here for the change? Yeah, I've been here yeah, from the from the beginning there. It was just at, at first just recipes developed in a kitchen. Like you, you could picture someone making it in their home kitchen. That's pretty much how it started here too. I'm um, gonna just pause right here and say that I think I should shout out a guy named Steve Viarengo, who is a backyard chili grower who made what was called Enzo's hot sauce, uh. which became kind of fun and tell me if I'm wrong at any point here, but according to Caroline and Tim, they got obsessed with Enzo's hot sauce and they were like, We think we could make hot sauce and thus their hot sauce is born. Whoa, I know but about I, Enzo's, I, but I, I didn't know, know Enzo's. I don't know that was relationship. An influence for that. <laughs> <laughs> I may be speaking out of school, but that's the story that at least Steve told me. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a lot of mythology around how it started, I guess. <laughs> make yeah. more myths. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, love it. I love the myth. No, no, myth, myth. Yeah. The original sriracha was made for Chili Fest, and Chili Fest was started when Kitchen Garden and Stone Soup joined for a couple of seasons, and Chili Fest had been a a thing they did together, serving chili and serving hot sauce. That's how Kitchen Garden Sriracha was born. Mm. So the yeah, the year I started, 2014, was the first year that we decided to start producing the products, the srirachas and salsa specifically, in a commercial facility. So we, we started doing that in Greenfield at the um, Franklin County com- CDC, CDC, CDC yeah. the Community Processing Center. Once we built our own dedicated facility, we really started skyrocketed and went from a few hundred thousand dollars a year of, of evaluated products to a million. Wow. So, yeah. Did the dried pepper seem like a natural sort of progression of things to do? Yeah. I mean, we just grow a ton of peppers. We love peppers. We, you know, in the past have grown over a hundred varieties every year for Chili Fest partially. And drying peppers are just a really 
awesome type of pepper um, and we were doing them in a really small batch way and then we got a grant to build a large commercial dehydrator before that we were like dehumidifiers and space heaters in a little <laughs> room that we were like venting and that's how we were drying Long them. Ta- yes. we were basically sun drying that's insane <laughs> yeah. a lot of the dried peppers that's just a passion project for us too so we we just love peppers it was allowed, it allowed us to get into like to growing a, a bunch of different special peppers that weren't just like the crazy hot ones for blow your face off hot sauces. Yeah, and that's yeah. what I love and yeah. about your hot sauces is that they are very so flavorful and ho- as hot as you want them to be. Yeah, yeah. but like I was yes. super psyched to see that you had Calabrian peppers dried because mm-hmm. they were really hard to find. I was having to buy them online, and then all of a sudden I could get them locally, and I was like, oh, this is gonna be great. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about what led to your deciding to step up and take over this farm from Caroline and Tim, who um, are already in vacation mode and are in Hawaii. <laughs> Whoa. Whoa, that was instant. They need it, and it's they good for them. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah totally. Yeah, well, Tim and Caroline approached us uh, at the end of the summer this past year. Like um, both of you individually? or how Yes, did, yeah, both yeah. of us individually. So we we are the two well, long... I should say Caroline and Tim are married. Yeah. Are you two married? We are not. Yeah, so no, that's, not. this is yeah. also yeah. kind of interesting transition. Yes. Yeah, yeah, totally. Max has a wife and I have a partner and um, I think it's a really awesome thing to be starting a farm with someone who's not a romantic partner. It's Mm -hmm. a pretty like well-worn path to farm with your spouse. It definitely leads to a lot of troubles I think it it's hard to maintain something with your spouse and there's no getting away from the business part of it you don't get to go home and talk to someone who hasn't been at your job all day yeah. you go home and talk about business at the dinner table or before you're going to sleep at night and you know Max and I get to escape from that a little bit when we go home to our different <laughs> households and have someone else to talk to I think one of the goals for for Tim and Caroline I'll speak for them here I guess is was for years they've been thinking about how how are we going to be able to transition to that next generation to people that know the business and can can continue it in this with the same vision as us and they've said like you know they're, we're, they're so lucky to have people like lily and i who have grown with the business love the business just the, the idea of being able to pass it on to workers is something that feels novel in this world of small farming without naming names there's going to be a bunch of legacy farms that people know well that aren't going to be operating this season so the fact that anybody wants to continue what is now a legacy farm and kitchen garden and carry it into the next phase i think is good news for people who love locally grown food yeah for sure i mean that was honestly a part of it for tim and caroline was watching some other farms who were trying to get out of business and trying to pass it on to someone else and how hard it is for farms to make success session plans, especially if they don't have the the old school family pass down type of uh, structure built in where their kids are going to take over the farm or something. They were seeing other farms sort of struggling to figure out what was going to happen to their farm next. And they were like, we have these people working here right now who know the farm in and out, who are really passionate and who are ready to take over. And this is a time that we should do this so that we can give it to them and also um, just have more time with their family. That was a big, big piece in their decision to step back from the farm was just to be able to spend more time with their two teenage kids. Are there parts of the back end of the farm that you inherited that were kind of a surprise to you even after working here for so long? Uh, I mean, there are things that we are having to learn how to do, payroll and yeah. uh, <laughs> and all of the compliance stuff around organic and FDA food safety stuff for our processing facility and all that kind of stuff on top of obviously taxes and all the other things that businesses have to deal with that as people who've never owned businesses are totally new to us. Mm. Fun math things. A lot lot of new stuff. I think one of the first questions people ask when we say that we're buying the farm is, are you buying the kitchen too? Is it, is it one deal or are they keeping the kitchen? And um, it's the whole kit and caboodle. It's everything. We're (laughs) buying the land. We're buying the equipment. We're buying the kitchen. We're buying the intellectual. and the kitchen sink. Yes. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Hot sauce in my bag. Later in the show, Mr. Universe on a new Department of Defense report about aliens, plus a slice of Holyoke's past with historian Erica Slocum. Coming up, we'll take you inside the kitchen at Kitchen Garden to see how the jardinera gets made. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. 
for our kitchen garden in Sunderland with Lily Israel and Max Traunstein, who have just purchased this farm from Caroline Pam and Tim Wilcox, who've run it for the last 17-ish years and have not only grown vegetables and things, but have turned it into a commercial kitchen, making lots of salsa and incredible hot sauce and, and more. It smells awesome in here. It does smell awesome in here. Right, That's good. It's we, hair net time. We, yeah, is it redundant for me to wear a hair net? You can wear one if it makes you feel fun. You don't no, you have don't to wear don't one. Need to. It makes me feel included because I don't have hair. Yeah, so we're about to walk in to the production floor of the kitchen where jardinera is being made. And jardinera is our, um, well, it just is in general, an Italian-American mixed vegetable pickle. It uh, is a combination of cauliflower, carrots, hot peppers, celery, and vinegar and oil. So it's a vinegar and oil-based pickle. And it is most popular in Chicago, uh, used on meat sandwiches. And if you ever watch the Bear, I hear say, them be I, like, the jardinier on the sandwich. Ibra, make sandwiches. Don't stop. Yes, sir. I want them to have kitchen garden on, on the, the bear. bear. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. What might you bring to the beef as a new employee? Hi, everybody. We're just going to show them what's going on in here. Yeah. What's your name? My name is Bianca. We are currently filling jars with oil, and then they are going to go to the other station to get filled with the vegetables that have been sitting in brine, and then they get sent back to us, and after we finish the oil process, we'll put brine in and then put them to be steam cooked. So they get cooked in the jars? Oh, yes. wow, that's cool. With the lid. With the lid. It's a kind of novel sealing and sterilizing process that we, uh, Caroline, as she is so great at coming up with new systems and getting things approved and stuff, every process that we do in here has to be approved by a, a food safety analyst. If you've ever water bath canned things at home, if you make a jar full of veggies, you usually have to put it either in a pressure canner or a, a water bath canner where you fill up a huge thing with water and then you submerge merge the jars. We don't want to have to do that here because that would be very difficult to get the jars in and out. So instead we came up with a process using a combi oven, which is a steam oven, to get the jars and their contents up to the right temp so that everything would be sealed and sterilized in the jar. There are there different days of the week that it's like it's a jardinera day yes. on this day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's a there's basically a day by day schedule and it's nice nice for people who work here to have a have that kind of mixed up workflow where yeah, you'll have a sriracha day on a Tuesday and then a jardinera day on a Wednesday, salsa on Thursday. Do you yeah. play salsa music when you make the salsa? <laughs> I mean, that would be amazing. Sometimes. Which day is the worst day where you're like, oh no, it's sriracha day again? Or, and what's your name? Oh, my name is Chris. Is there a, is a day where you're like, oh no, it's fill in the blanks? Sriracha days are, in, involve a lot of heavy lifting. Not like I accidentally touched my eyes on Sriracha day. There's also that. <laughs> there's also <laughs> that. Always, yeah. No matter how careful you are, there's always times when you forget or miss. Yeah. The spiciness is in the air sometimes. Yeah. So, some people have to wear masks. Right. Yeah. I think they do I, weaponize peppers. Exactly, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, it can be pretty brutal, but it's always a fun process. Do you want to come see this? Yes. Yeah, yeah. The coolest part of the jardinera process. We got this tray specially made for us that has holes that the jars go under, and then you scoop the pickled vegetables on top of this tray, and then they go into each of the jars. Without seeing the visual, it's probably not as cool. No, but it's cool. I'm <laughs> it's like on the radio, it's Sifting it into the jars directly with yeah. a hole that's perfectly shaped overall, so that instead of having to individually stuff one jar after another, yeah. you can do, what is it? 30 jars at a time? One, four, two, one, two, three, three four, five, six, seven, seven eight, 28. We're, we're, we're yeah, like one step more efficient than, than hand packing <laughs> most of our stuff. It's just a sheet tray, it's a hotel bag. Yeah. It also, <laughs> it's very satisfying to watch it go into all the holes and fill up like that. This is the most Mr. Rogers we've been in a while. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> this is like how the crayons get made. When they yeah. come out of the crayon machine, it's yeah, so satisfying to watch. Yeah, this is how it watch. gets made. Now watch the crayons come into those crayon collectors. Jardinera. My name is Lisa Valeri, and I'm just here um, packing the jars individually. Are you, you the know. Jardinera? The jar Jardinera? Yeah. Um, yeah, so after we pack these into those holes, like, there's no guarantee that that 28 um, jars we just made are all the same weight. So then we weigh them over here, and after that we cap it. 
It smells so good. Do you get sick of this smell after doing this over and over again, or do you like go home yes. and eat this? A hundred percent. You never want to eat jardinera ever. I mean, there's some things, like especially when we are doing sriracha, the, there's this pickled pepper smell. Randomly has this cheesy after smell. I don't understand how. You get really sick of it. So as you wear a mask just so that, not only because the pepper can become airborne, then you start coughing and it's not fun, but it's also because you're like, maybe I just don't want to smell this all day. Okay, now we're walking into the dehydrator. Max and Lily, the new owners of Kitchen Garden in Sunderland. It's got like three huge door entrances. It's it's like a, the airlock on the International Space Station. Yeah, they put a building around the building. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Wow, that's cool. Should be up to code. Yeah, it's basically just like a cooler almost. The the sides are like cooler panels, and then it's got mesh on the sides, and then it's got a giant contraption over on that side that that sucks out the moisture and heats the space and blows the steam out the side. What temperature does it go up to in here? That's a good like question. If it's really it's... cold outside, or you're like, I'm just gonna go take a minute in the dehydrator. <laughs> well, we're generally like a sauna. Only, we're only running it really in the fall, oh, yeah. and because we run it when we have fresh peppers yeah, to dry, yeah. which is the fall. So, although we do do some dehydrating for other businesses, we dry out some mushrooms for Mycoterra. Sometimes oh, we dry out oh, some. We went to their factory. Nice, <laughs> and we dry out some ginger for old friends for their teas. Nice, but it's not too hot because dehydrating something is like not the temperature of cooking. Yeah, but it's fun. You, you, if you come by the farm on any given day during a processing season, you'll just get a different aroma. Yeah, Even in here nice right now, it smells like savory and cheesy almost, yeah. like she was saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Eight pounds of fresh peppers make one pound of dried peppers. Yeah, wow. That's actually pretty good. Yeah, compared yeah. to maple syrup, yeah. that's a good ratio. Yeah, got a lot more fiber in there than maple syrup. <laughs> you can look at a greenhouse. Yeah, we like to talk about our fresh produce because we're getting we ready to we get don't want people to go. think we're just a, a sauce farm we <laughs> we really are a vegetable farm um, and the sauces exist as a way to make our vegetable production sales revenue be more year-round but you know, we really identify as a vegetable farm. You are right on the banks of the Connecticut right here in Sunderland. Did that overflow during all of the flooding of July of last year? Or? We certainly didn't go swimming in the Connecticut River last season. <laughs> it never overflowed directly into our field, so we were spared. We were lucky. We had a lot of excess standing water in the field, which led to higher plant disease uh -huh. incidents. But Oh, it's so beautiful and smells so nice, and it's so warm in here in this greenhouse. It feels hopeful. We're looking at our spring arugula and spicy mix, which is a, a salad greens mix that we grow. Mm. It's doing pretty well right now. They're all like Ooh. like an inch tall. Yeah. Next week, we'll be in here harvesting. Yeah, it's it's just comes up so fast. Yeah, that's faster <laughs> than I would have thought. But yeah, yeah, it's just the, the greenhouse effect, as they say. You know, uh, the heat. Sometimes it works in your favor. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like I have to ask if there's a chance that Chili Fest comes back. Monty asked that like first thing when he I got know, here. Because we both were talking we about it. We both loved yes. Chili Fest. We both Fest. loved Chili yes. Fest. Yeah, not in the foreseeable future. It's not in our plans. We both love Chili Fest and would love for it to exist. It's just the, the difficulty of planning and putting it on while also having a 70 acre farm and a production kitchen. Maybe, maybe someday in the far future or maybe someone else who wants to come and yeah. put it on for us. <laughs> maybe I'll ask Caroline when she gets back from Hawaii. Maybe she wants to do it. I mean, they're not doing quite as much anymore, so. <laughs> All around the kitchen cock Kitchen Garden Farm is currently running a crowdfunding campaign to help offset some of the closing costs of the ownership transfer, and we'll post information about that in today's show notes. On, on, the, <laughs> on the way, discovering a housing project lost to time and memory with local historian Erica Slocum. But first, the government gives us a rundown on aliens, and Mr. Universe is here to tell us how they are currently answering our extraterrestrial questions. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. To boldly go where no man has gone before. Time for some more kitchen table astronomy at the Amherst Kitchen Table of Hampshire College astronomer Dr. Salman Hamid, Mr. Universe. Happy birthday, Monty. Oh, thank <laughs> you. It was my birthday over the weekend. In astronomic time, it makes no difference. Although, isn't it interesting to think of that every single thing that every person is made up of is as old as the universe, right? 
So in some ways, I'm 13.8 billion years old. Yeah, in some ways, I think so. But 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 you're also right. Like you know, in cosmic terms, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, maybe 13.8 billion years. That's a lot of candles. But you can use stars. And our galaxy has plenty of those. And given how many stars there are, Mr. Universe, it would be inconceivable, it seems, that there isn't life on a planet around one of those stars. And it would even be inconceivable, it seems, that there wouldn't be intelligent life around one of those stars. However, we have zero evidence of that as human beings on this planet. And there is a new report out, the Department of Defense All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office <laughs> report on the historical record of the U.S. government involvement with unidentified anomalous phenomenon. They're not even calling it unidentified aerial phenomenon anymore. They keep changing this on us. UFO, UAP, they changed the definition of UAP. And now it's our role. The All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office that deals with that. So uh, I would say it's our role. <laughs> <laughs> so let me reiterate. We don't yet have any evidence for life other than the Earth so far. Can there be life elsewhere? This is one of those things that I can bet my house, Earth, galaxy, whatever you want. Like, you know, yes, okay. The likelihood is very, very high. Uh, and the reason is because the elements that, that we are made up of, those are not rare elements. The conditions where life arose here on Earth, those are not rare conditions. And the fact that we have trillions of planets, probably, just in the Milky Way galaxy, and there are more than 100 billion galaxies, at least, each containing 100 billion stars in our universe that we know of. So the likelihood, even if you say, oh, it's a one in a trillion chance. Oh, yeah, there are plenty of opportunities, right? <laughs> in fact, the question really is, can we find evidence for life on another planet in our solar system? And even there, I think the likelihood is pretty high. I think it would be surprising if we do not find life, for example, in the oceans of Europa, simply because the conditions, again, you have the raw material, you have the conditions there. In my mind, it would be more surprising if there is no life at all. But we are talking about microbial life. No, that's not what people are excited about. People they want like, aliens. They, they want, want E.T. 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 E. Good. And that's right. And so there things become a little bit more complicated because, of course, we only have one example of, of even intelligent life and, and depending upon how you define it. So there are more examples of it on Earth. If we think about other primates, we can talk about whales, we can talk about dolphins and so on and so forth. So it's that's a bigger question is there intelligent life so again depending upon how you define it probably there's intelligent life too but the thing that we are interested in are there being species out there that have technology that can communicate with us or can travel across stars and that is really interesting and since we've been around only for four and a half billion years the universe has been around as you mentioned your age my 20, birthday 13.8 13 13 billion. billion years and so there must be other planets out there which potentially maybe have life and have had enough time for example to have evolved maybe for uh, to develop technology and so on and so forth but you can imagine complex life and given enough time for our human species in theory you could have uh, colonized the galaxy and again colonize is a bad word so no, i mean yes. like, you know in, in that <laughs> sense but ability in the next a million years or so to go around but also we can also see the complications with that because we may not be around for that long not the least of it because of climate change and so on and so forth so there can be catastrophes nuclear catastrophe and things like that fermi's paradox if there is intelligent life why haven't we encountered it yet one of the answers to that we don't have a tr true one single answer is that when species become so intelligent that they could travel off of a planet they inevitably destroy themselves Right. And, and also, I mean, why would they come to us? I mean, that's that's the other thing. I mean, like, you know, we think, oh, we are so important. But yeah, no, we, we just may not be. And they're like, hey, this is the obscure, sad little corner of the Milky Way galaxy. And who cares? We just don't want to go there. Like, you know, and so that is totally possible. So there can be many different solutions to that. And some people claim, and they have been claiming for a while, that actually, we already have evidence for aliens visiting the earth and mostly it comes from what are known as ufos and in fact last year there was even a congressional testimony by david grush who was a former intelligence officer who actually testified that other people within the government has told him he had not direct evidence have told him that the government are in possession of extraterrestrial 
technology and extraterrestrial spacecrafts. And in fact, he even talked about alien bodies and he said of alien biologic or non-terrestrial biologics and so on and so forth. So the Congress has actually authorized for NASA, for DOD and for others to actually investigate these claims and report it. So this new report, which is a Department of Defense report, came out uh, March 8th, so very recently. That is from the Department of Defense All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office, or ARO. <laughs> and right in the executive summary, AARO, so again, this uh, office, found no evidence that any U.S. government investigation, academic-sponsored research, or official review panel has confirmed that any sighting of a UAP represented extraterrestrial technology. So this is their top line. I, I really like the fact like, you know, that they included academic sponsored research as well. And they actually go on and say that you cannot explain all of the unidentified phenomena because a lot of them are just unidentified and those things are there. But they say that they believe that this is mainly due to a lack of data. And if more and or better quality information were available, many of those sightings could be identified as ordinary objects or phenomena. And that is the key thing. I mean, people think, oh, wait a minute, what is that? And if you cannot explain it, it must be a spacecraft from another uh, civilization. But that is the wrong way in terms of thinking about how science works. Because just because we don't know something doesn't mean that it is something. Don't jump right to aliens. Right, and and so, and in fact, because the claim of aliens is so extraordinary, as Carl Sagan would say, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, and that is not an extraordinary evidence. I don't understand what it is, hence it must be an alien. No, and so this report, I actually really liked this report because they actually have a pretty sober view about that, and they also say there is a correlation. When you have more information, it turns out those are explainable without alien spaceships. And they explicitly say that AARO found no empirical evidence for claims that the US government and private companies have been reverse engineering extraterrestrial technology. So again, I'm reading from the report from the executive summary. AARO determined based on all information provided to date that claims involving specific people, known locations, technological tests, and documents allegedly involved in or related to the reverse engineering or extraterrestrial technology are inaccurate. And in fact, they go on to actually say that usually this is the same small number of people, a small circle that actually makes these claims and reconfirms uh, within that claim. These claims are mostly the result of circular reporting from a group of individuals who believe this to be the case, despite the lack of any evidence. So I love it. Like, you know, I mean, I think they're very clear cut about these things. I am sure everybody is going to say, this is it. Thank you very much. Uh, and let's move on to something else. You think? <laughs> Will Avi Loeb, the Harvard uh, astrophysicist, move on? Because he's a big part of this, too, where he is a smart guy, but he really believes that we have been visited by aliens and, and is in a, what feels non-scientific way, multiple times has advocated for things being alien tech without, I think, proper evidence. Now, the other end of this coin could be, it's a big, big government conspiracy. This is a fake report from the government reporting on itself, doesn't want to tell us the truth about aliens. Maybe Avi Loeb has it right after all. Well, by the way, so this is exactly what has happened because already people who do believe in that have come out and says, well, this is an example of a government cover-up because there is no way. So this again goes back to the nature of conspiracy theories, like, you know, that there is no way to satisfy those who don't want to believe in that. Right. You can always say that, of course, that's exactly what they are going to say <laughs> if they are covering it up, that there is no evidence. So how are you going to say if there is no evidence, right? I mean, so you have to think in terms of that. But again, the issue regarding that is the claims have to be backed by extraordinary evidence and the likelihood that such a claim has been hidden, it is just such a huge burden on that, that it's unlikely. Let me come back to Avi Loeb in a second uh, because he has made claims about, for example, a, a comet that had come in from some other solar system or, or, or interstellar. It was not from our own solar system. Normally, comets come are part of, the, uh, of our own solar system. But this one, we knew that it came from uh, out of our solar system because of its speed and trajectory, the way it was passing through it. It's a very interesting comet. It was named Oumuamua. But Avi Loeb claimed that it was 
an extraterrestrial spacecraft. And that has been uh, hugely controversial because Avi Loeb is not an expert on comets, nor does he was he part of the team that discovered it and analyzed it and studied it. And that team came up and said, actually, no, that is not the case. It is natural, so and so forth. But more recently, Avi Loeb had also claimed that there was a meteor, a fireball, a piece of meteoroid that crashed uh, off the coast of Papua New Guinea. Then he got convinced a billionaire to actually fund a mission to scrape through the ocean bottom to find evidence for this alien technology. And despite most scientists, most astronomers, most geologists saying like, ah, it actually is not the case. And in fact, what he found from the ocean floor, I think actually it's pretty much terrestrial. It's from the earth. But recently, a new paper was just published by Benjamin uh, Fernando. He's a planetary seismologist at Johns Hopkins University. He says, actually, the seismic data that was used to locate the piece of an asteroid actually that fell into the ocean was from, from Papua New Guinea, but it was a truck because that same signal actually went towards one of the hospitals in Papua New Guinea and they turned around and came back closer. So they said, well, I mean, you know, unless that's a spacecraft that is turning around and coming back, uh, no, and so it wasn't. So this is just a great example of a, how science is done in the sense that, I mean, there are experts in it and you have to know what you don't know. A seismologist, for example, would be a good person to consult if I'm using seismic data. But nevertheless, as Monty, you also used Harvard astronomer. We don't use those things for other astronomers, although there are tens I, of thousands of I use of it for us. you all the time. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> um, but that's the issue. Oh, Harvard astronomer, Avi Loeb. Well, yeah. But a lot of Harvard astronomers have been wrong as well. The key thing about science is it doesn't matter. You may be Einstein, actual Einstein, and you can be wrong. And so was Einstein was on multiple occasions. You go like, oh, who are you at Einstein and you are wrong? Well, yeah, you can be wrong. That's the thing about science. For good science, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter which institution you are linked with. It depends on the evidence. And if you are still not happy with this explanation, I would like to call Harvard politician, Ron DeSantis, <laughs> Yale lawyer, Clarence Thomas. That's the problem with this type of thing that it doesn't matter if Harvard astronomer says that, do we have any evidence or not? Pulling back the circle, and this new report actually says, ah, not so much. The bar for such an evidence is very high. You can check out this new report, the Department of Defense All Domain Anomaly Resolution Office a report on the historical record of the U.S. government involvement with unidentified anomalous phenomena. Volume one is available now. Volume two cannot wait for it. <laughs> <laughs> Makes you wonder how many volumes they're going to end up having. I don't know. It's like I a Marvel movie. Oh, no. <laughs> Up next, discovering a Holyoke ho housing project lost to time and memory with local historian Erica Slocum. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on 88.5 NEPM. The Fabulous 413 podcast is funded by Northeast Solar, homegrown in Hatfield, Massachusetts, and providing energy savings for their customers for over 10 years. Learn more at northeast-solar.com. I didn't know uh, about better places to live. Um, Liberty Park had running water and um, had an indoor toilet and a, a roof. So I didn't realize that wasn't okay, that you shouldn't be hearing your neighbor's conversation. I didn't realize any of that. That is from a new podcast called Drawing Liberty Park from Memory. Welcome back to The Fabulous 413. I'm Monty Belmonte. And I'm Colise Smith. Joining us is the creator of that podcast, Erica Slocum. Erica is a PhD candidate in the UMass Amherst W.E.B. Du Bois Department of African American Studies. Erica is from Springfield. She's a mother, an artist, a community organizer, world traveler, and advocate for social justice. Erica is the co-founder of the community organization, the Western Mass Women's Collective, and she's now a podcaster. Her new podcast, Drawing Liberty Park from Memory, is brought to you by PRX and New England Public Media. Hey, that's us. That's us. With funding provided by Mass Humanities, and now she gets to tell us all about it. Thanks for joining us. 
Thanks for having me. I also just want to point out that I'm the director of interpretation at Harry Beecher Stowe. Yeah. Yes. Which is like fantastic. I didn't and know th- the full title that you'd stepped into, but I yeah. knew that you were doing this work, and that's fascinating and awesome too. Yeah. Just like constantly doing cool stuff with like history in the area. So, why Liberty Park? So, honestly, I think. Um, uh, I always like start with this story of like we had a community collection day at Wisteria Hearst, right? And um, Doug Griffin and Miss Diane, whose voice we just heard, um, Diane McCullum, came in and they were like, "Do you remember Liberty Park? I remember Liberty Park." And they go into this whole like story about Liberty Park, right? And they're asking everyone who comes in, "Do you remember Liberty Park?" <laughs> and it's like, you know, Miss Diane goes into this. Um, I don't know, like, we continue to connect, and every time we speak, she's like, look, I know it existed, right? And I have these records from, you know, the Monarch Club uh, petitioning the government because, you know, things weren't right there. And so she was like, I know it was real, but you talk to, you know, Holyoke Housing Authority, they don't remember. Um, When I went to um, speak with Eileen at the Holyoke Public Room, Um, at the public library or the Holyoke room at the public library, you know, she says, well, we have records, but only up until, you know, uh, I think 1946. And Miss Diane's like, no, Erica, I grew up there. Like, you know, when I moved here, like, you know, it was a thing. It was like, you know, such a large portion of, you know, who I am and my experience of coming to Holyoke. And so I think, like, you know, her just, like, real interest in it. And um, her saying to me one time, she said, like, um, I feel like everyone forgot, but I remember, you Mm. know. Um, And so I was just like, it just kind of, like, nagged at me for a really long time. Out to prove that it's not actually Mandela effect, that it's something that really was there. Yeah, and and also, like, so my grandmother um, in Springfield was, like, a, a housing advocate. And so I'm like, you know, I started asking her and my aunt, uh, Ruthann, I'm like, how do I find this stuff, <laughs> right? Like, how do I find this information? And they're giving me tips. And, you know, like, again, like, you, you start to look into things, and little by little you find new information. Um, and when I was working with uh, Historic New England last year, I got access to, like, resources that I was just like, Oh, like it's here. Like for <laughs> real, it existed. Cool. We're speaking to Erica Slocum, who has a new podcast, Drawing Liberty Park from Memory. Tell us where Liberty Park was in Holyoke. Like what is it? What's there now? So right now um, it's the Conklin um, uh, business furniture store or. Yeah. I think yeah. That's, OK. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's where Conklin is at Appleton and Winter Street. Uh huh. I think I drove right near there today on the way here. Yeah, so like way, <laughs> way down, like like practically in the flats. Yeah, yeah, lower yeah. Holyoke. Yep. And so you, we heard a little bit from Miss Diane, and, and the podcast is called "Drawing Liberty Park from Memory." Mm-hmm. So, how many places have you been able to find in your role, sort of as a historian, that match up with the memories that Miss Diane and maybe others have about this neighborhood, this project? So part of the reason why the name exists is because, so um, in the fall, last fall, 2023, um, excuse me, we had a, a exhibit at uh, Wisteria Hearst. And um, I was sitting down with Miss Diane and I'm like, I found the records. I'm going to write up this thing. But in order for me to write up this thing, I want to have, like as a visual learner, I need to have a picture of what this place looks like. And... Um, so she actually did like a preliminary sketch for me. And then like as an artist, I'm like, okay, I can look at pictures of old buildings during this time that are like World War II, um, you know, construction. Um, I, can, I can map it out, right? Um, and so I did that. And so then we sat down and we went over it. And so in recording the podcast episode, um, we were able to like, do the work of her being like, okay, so like this is there, yes, that's right, you know, like okay, so you gotta have to move this around, you know what I mean, to like make it more realistic. Um, but when um, what we did for the exhibit was we blew that up and we put it on the wall, 
And so folks were able to come into the space. And I think that um, there were some folks uh, like the Kennedys, um, Robert and uh, Mrs. Jeanette Kennedy, um, who are Holyoke residents, Doug Griffin again, um, who came into the space and they were like, yo, I remember this, <laughs> right? And so I, like more and more, it was just like reaffirmed that like not only was it real, um, but just being able to have, you know, the the history written out on the wall and to see like that visual re- representation, like folks were like, I can I can visualize what this place like looked like. I can visualize and remember what this place, you know, sounded like. Um, and so I think it was just like, you know, That's like it. just powerful. <laughs> Well, should, yeah. let's play another clip because okay. another thing that Miss Diane and you do really well with this podcast is creating a, a sensory memory of this. And one of my favorite clips has to do with the noises and smells of Liberty Park. What did Liberty Park sound like? Oh, it was with children playing. Grown-ups would play cards. So you'd have that banter back and forth. And in the summer when it was warm enough, they set up the card tables in the in the court there outside still in the back but like I say you had the the trash talking about the and the bid bid whist and I bid this and that kind of stuff but the kids were running around in happy noise, happy noise. <laughs> happy I like noise. that happy noise what did Liberty Park smell like to you like somebody was always cooking something so it always smelled something good to eat. <laughs> my very favorite smell was my grandmother's yeast rolls. And the house often smelled like rising bread. I like that. Yeah, yeah. And when I go to a restaurant now, if, they're, if they have fresh rolls, it r- reminds me of Mama's rolls, Yeah. That is from the podcast, Drawing Liberty Park from Memory, from Erica Slocum, featuring Ms. Diane right there. I lo- The question, what did it smell like, is like the greatest question. And Kalise and I actually got to sit in on a PRX kind of review where we got to get previews of this early on. And I love that question really stood out to me then, too, because scent is such a powerful memory. Mm-hmm. And uh, the... the Ms. Diane seems to really connect with that. Um, mm-hmm. Tell us what that community meant to her and to other people that you might have spoken to that were part of that Liberty Park community in Holyoke? I think, um, so there is a part where she talks about like what that really meant, right? Because it was like, there wasn't a lot, there weren't a lot of spaces where um, black folks were one, allowed to live and allowed to live in kind of like a concentrated Um, community, right? And so she talks about Liberty Park and um, Bethlehem Baptist Church, which is still in existence today on Sargent Street um, uh, in Holyoke. But them being really core to like uh, who she was and her understanding of just her understanding of community, right? And like her understanding, you know, she was like outside of this, like that was all I had. That's what I knew, right? And so I think that you know, for Doug, Doug never lived in Liberty Park, but a lot of his family members and because of the nature of like church community, you know, like the deacons from the church lived there. Um, there were folks who did hair that lived in Liberty Park, you know, um, the the kids who went to Morgan Street School, um, a lot of them lived in Liberty Park um, um, at this time. And so it's like, I think it was so integral to... Um, like what their community was, you know, that even when folks didn't live there, that was a place that they went to. So the when the project was shut down, um, the government offered it to Holyoke and Holyoke refused. Mm-hmm. And despite the shoddiness with which the project were initially built, that kind of sends a certain message to the community that lives there. And I feel like it's also important to mention that, like, this was a mixed uh, mixed ethnicity housing project. Mm-hmm. So do you feel like there are repercussions of that decision that are still reflected in the black community in Holyoke today? And, and when did that decision happen? So um, 
so from the time, so Liberty Park is um, built, I think the doors open in 1941 or 1943. Um, I think they started building them in 41. Um, I think the first folks start moving in November 1943. For a historian, bad with dates. So I just, <laughs> just want to preface that, the statement with that. Um, but, um, and so from the beginning, um, Holyoke Housing Authority does not want Liberty Park. Like they, they vote unanimously no. And the president of the board at the time said this is the first time in 12 years that they voted no. And part of the reason that he cites um, is because they can't discriminate, right, against uh, black folks, um, and um, at, at, again at that at that time, that's the only project apartments that allow black folks to live in, and and so like there's this legacy, right, um, like as you move through the history, as you move through time, where like black folks aren't allowed to live above the canal in Holyoke, and then later. Um, you know, not until I think like the 50s or so, they're able to live up to High Street, but not beyond High Street. And if you're in Holyoke and you look up, like Holyoke is the second, I think, um, in the U.S. in this in intentional industrial community, right? Only second to, I think, Lowell. Mm. Um, and don't come for me if that's wrong, because <laughs> again, I don't do Eastern Mass history. <laughs> um, but um Again, so it's in, it's it's intentionally built, right? And so um, all the folks who own the factories live up on the hill going towards Northampton. Everybody who works in the factories, housing is built in that area intentionally, right? And so Liberty Park isn't necessarily, I mean, it is a part of that complex, right? Because it's not built as military housing. It's built for those folks who migrate um, to the space to work in factories, in municipal uh, works, you know, offices and buildings um, um, and, and the like, right? And so I think that um, when you talk about the legacy of that kind of like treatment of folks in housing, you know, I had a number of people who came and saw the history, like haven't heard the podcast, haven't heard about, you know, us talk about it, but have have seen, you know, the exhibit and we're just like this is still happening today right um and just making those comparisons um on their own and i'm i'm looking back at the history not so much you know at the contemporary issues but again like when i speak to people from the community you know black brown you know latino folks it's like yeah like well this is still happening today even with the you know gentrification of that space that's happening Erica Slocum, who has produced a podcast drawing Liberty Park from memory, it was a co-created or assisted by PRX, Public Radio International, and mm -hmm. us here at New England Public Media, as well as uh, funding by Mass Humanities. Is it available already? Are, are we able to experience the podcast yet? No, not yet, because of all the <laughs> things that I do. <laughs> um, I'm still actually working uh, working on, um, so I'm working with Gina from PRX, who's been like great in helping me edit everything together um, and just putting the episode together more concisely. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm hoping that at the end of this month, We'll have an actual episode, and I don't have anywhere to put it. So <laughs> if y'all want to air it, <laughs> y'all let me we know. We have a podcast <laughs> that we put out every day. We could, we could, I, yeah. I mean, yeah. we'll have to talk this. to the powers that be here, but I don't see why we couldn't I mean, post it on our feed. We did sponsor it, so, yeah. Yeah. so why yeah, not? For sure, and, we sh um, you know, and we'll definitely want to tell the listeners yeah. um, when it's Absolutely. ready to go so that they Absolutely. can experience it. Uh, before we let you go, let's hear one more little clip from... Miss Diane, about um, how the community came together around her first TV. <laughs> we, we were the first ones in our two units there to have a TV. But, but, and I'm thinking it was because I wasn't able to go to school. And my, my father said that I should have some uh, education. <laughs> and so of course, I had two sets of books. I had a set of encyclopedia and a set of the greatest story ever told. And that was in, in six volumes, I believe. What was the greatest story ever told? The Bible. <laughs> 
So I just wanted to hear you say it out loud. <laughs> that is Erica Slocum and Miss Diane from Drawing Liberty Park from Memory, hopefully available later this month, and we'll certainly tell you when it is. Thank you so much, Erica Slocum, for coming in. Thank you for having me. Of course, always a pleasure. I'm Khalees Smith. I'm Monty Belmonte. We will see you tomorrow on the Fabulous 413. Indeed. Indeed.